Welcome to the electronicshobbyblog.com. I'm your host, Dominic Soldano, and today we're talking inductors in DC circuits. We'll look at both steady state and transient response, and I'll show you how to protect your electronic circuits from inductive transient spikes. In addition, we'll look at how to use an inductor to create a DC to DC boost converter that can convert 5 volts to 10 volts. Let's get started. An inductor, like a capacitor, is an energy storage device. But unlike a capacitor, which stores its energy in an electric field, the inductor stores its energy in a magnetic field. Current, passing through the coils of the inductor, creates magnetic lines of flux that run down the center of the inductor and around the inductor. This magnetic field is how the inductor stores energy. Like a capacitor, resist changes in voltage, an inductor resists changes in current. The current through an inductor can't change instantaneously. Here you see the various symbols that are used to represent an inductor on a schematic. The symbol itself will tell you what type of core the inductor has. Different types of cores impart different characteristics to the inductor. Inductors on a schematic are usually designated by a capital letter L. The units of inductance are measured in henries. You'll most commonly find inductors in microhenries or millihenries. Like other electronic components, inductors come in many shapes and sizes. Here in the lower left corner, you'll see some toroidal cores. Up on the right is an inductor that looks very much like a resistor, and it's got color bands that you read in much the same way that you would read a resistor's color bands. In the top center are some chip inductors. These are small surface mount devices. While the core material will change the properties, the size of an inductor is generally proportional to the inductance. Let's look at how an inductor behaves in a DC circuit. Take this circuit as an example. We've got a voltage source, V, and then a switch that can switch a resistor and inductor in series either between the voltage source or ground. Now let's assume that we start with the inductor discharged and the switch in the open position. It's neither connected to the battery nor to ground. In this condition, the current through the resistor and inductor is zero and the voltage drop across the resistor and the inductor is also zero. Now let's flip the switch so it contacts the battery. In a resistive or capacitive circuit, we would expect current to start flowing. But remember, the current through an inductor can't change instantaneously. Since it was zero the instant before we threw the switch, it'll be zero the instant after we throw the switch. So using Ohm's law, we know that if the current through the resistor is zero, then the voltage across the resistor has to be zero as well. And if the voltage across the resistor is zero, and there's a 5 volt battery, then Kirchhoff's voltage law tells us that that 5 volts has to be across the inductor. So at the instant we throw the switch, the voltage across the inductor is 5 volts, and the voltage across the resistor is 0 volts, and the current is zero. After the switch is thrown, the inductor will start to charge. The current will slowly build from zero to the maximum current that the circuit's going to carry. The rate of charge is based on a time constant, tau, and that constant tau is given by the inductance in henrys divided by the circuit resistance in ohms. The inductor will charge to approximately 66% of its final value within one tau, and then 66% of the remainder each tau after that. So at the end of two tau, it will be charged to 88.4% of its maximum value. If you recall our lesson on capacitors, it works exactly like a capacitor, except in this case, what's charging is current instead of voltage. And we say that the inductor is fully charged after five tau, or five time constants. Let's work an example problem. Here's an example where our source is 5 volts, our resistor is 1 ohm, and our inductor is 1 henry. That means that the time constant, tau, 
is equal to L on R, or 1 Henry on 1 Ohm, which equals 1 second. When evaluating a DC circuit with an inductor, we always assume that once the inductor is fully charged, its resistance is zero. Now in reality, the wire itself has a little bit of resistance, but for calculation's sake, we assume it to be zero and it makes the calculations a lot easier and works out close enough. So using that assumption to calculate the current, the current would be equal to the 5 volts divided by the 1 ohm, or final max current will be equal to 5 amps. That means that the inductor will charge from 0 amps to 5 amps over 5 tau, or 5 seconds. You can see in the table that we've calculated out how much it charges for each time period. And like a capacitor, it never actually reaches full value. It just continues to approach it asymptotically forever. However, for all practical purposes and for our own engineering sanity, we assume that it's fully charged within five time periods. Now let's assume that the inductor has had time to fully charge. So our circuit has five amps flowing through it, which means according to Ohm's law, the resistor has five volts across it and the inductor has zero volts across it. Now let's assume we can instantaneously throw the switch to the bottom position. We would expect that the inductor would start to discharge, but remember, the current through an inductor can't change instantaneously. That means that the five amps will continue to flow in the circuit in the same direction at the exact moment that the switch is thrown. If the five amps continues to flow in the same direction, then there's still five volts across the resistor. But since there's no more battery in the circuit, what's going to counteract that 5 volts? Remember, Kirchhoff's voltage law still has to hold true. And the only way that can hold true is if the voltage across the inductor instantaneously reverses. And that's exactly what happens. And all of a sudden, the inductor becomes a voltage source. As soon as the switch is thrown and the battery is no longer energizing the inductor, the magnetic field starts to decay. The inductor gives its energy back to the circuit. As the magnetic field collapses, the inductor begins to discharge, following the same exponential curve that it used to charge. That is, it will shed 66% of its charge within the first tau, and 66% of the remainder within the next tau, and so on and so forth. Using the same 1 ohm and 1 henry values, we have the same tau of 1 second. So that means that within 5 seconds, or 5 tau periods, the current will have completely decayed to zero. Now let's look at a really interesting case. Let's assume that the circuit has been energized and the inductor is fully charged. At this point, there's 5 amps flowing through the circuit, there's 5 volts across the 1 ohm resistor, zero volts through the inductor. But what happens if we throw the switch only part of the way? That is, if we all of a sudden leave an open circuit. Well, here's where it gets really interesting. Remember, the current through an inductor can't change instantaneously. So that current in that exact instant is still flowing in the circuit. But if we've got an open circuit, then what's the resistance? Well, in essence, it's infinite. Well, if we have infinite resistance, and we have a 5 amp current flowing, then what's the voltage in the circuit? Well, Ohm's law tells us it's infinite. Now, that's impossible. The voltage can't actually be infinite. But what will happen is that the voltage will continue to climb, and climb, and climb, and climb, until it gets high enough to jump the gap between the open contacts of the switch in the form of a spark. And that normally occurs around 30 kilovolts per centimeter. Now it happens very quickly after you open the switch, so it never really gets anywhere near 30 kilovolts, but the voltage can get quite high. This phenomenon is known as an inductive transient spike. An inductive transient spikes ruin electronics all the time. The best way to protect against inductive transient spikes is by including a reverse bias diode across the inductor. This way, when the voltage across the inductor changes polarity, 
the current will have a path by which it can discharge. During my first year in engineering school, I designed a relay control circuit that worked off a microprocessor. And it looked like this. Essentially, when there was a voltage at the base of the transistor, the relay would turn on. And when the voltage was removed, the relay would turn off. I hadn't learned about inductive transient spikes yet, so I didn't realize that every time I turned it off, the collapsing magnetic field on the inductor, which is what the coil of a relay is, would uh, blow a hole through the junction of the transistor. Every time I demoed it to my classmates, I had to replace all of the transistors on the board. Once I'd learned about inductive transient spikes, I simply put a reverse bias diode across the coil of the relay, and my problems were solved. After that, I didn't have to replace any transistors. The lesson learned here is always put a reverse bias diode across any inductors in a digital circuit. While inductive transitive spikes can be a problem, we can also harness them to our advantage. That's how a DC boost converter works in order to raise voltage above what the input supply is. So let's take a look at this boost converter circuit. This is fairly simplified, but in its simplest form, it's really nothing more than opening and closing a switch and using the power of the inductor to boost the voltage. Let's look at how this works. The MOSFET acts as a switch, and as we pulse it, it opens and closes. Let's look at each of the state. Let's assume we start with the switch closed. So current flows through the inductor and energizes it. So now the inductor has five volts across. When the MOSFET switch opens, the voltage across the inductor reverses polarity. So now the five volt battery and the five volts across the inductor are additive. And so we end up with 10 volts on the left side of that diode. There's a small voltage drop across the diode, but other than that, it's all across the capacitor. So we've got 9.3 volts across the capacitor, which now charges to the full 9.3 volt. Assuming we get the timing right, then that capacitor will hold on to that 9 volts and deliver it to the load. Now this is a fairly simplistic circuit, so there's a lot to be done with getting the timing right and making sure the decay rates are right and making sure the capacitor's the right value and you know everything's got to be sized to the load. But this is essentially how a DC boost converter works. And there are special ICs that manage all of the timing and all of that stuff for you. But essentially, we've converted 5 volts to 9.3 volts. Let's go look at transitive spikes in the lab. I've set up this simple circuit in the lab. We've got a 555 timer feeding the input to this circuit, and I've put that 12 volt reverse bias diode there to protect against the transitive spikes that we're actually going to be looking for. Actually, I forgot it on the first try and ended up blowing up a 555 timer, so this is actually the second 555 timer. I've got a 555 timer set up to act as the opening and closing of our switch. And here's the 555 coming on. Don't worry about those spikes, but here's the 555 coming on. And notice as soon as the 555 comes on, it's as if we close the switch and the voltage on, let's get that lined up. The voltage on our inductor goes up to about the same voltage as the 555 timer. And then as it charges, the current through it um, starts to increase and the voltage across it starts to drop as the voltage goes across the resistor. Let's see how long it takes. It seems to take to go to zero, one, two, three, four, five divisions. Well, how does that compare if each division's 10 microseconds to our prediction? Well, we've got a 1000 microhenry inductor, so basically one millihenry, and we've got a 100 ohm resistor. So one millihenry divided by um, 100 ohms is uh, 10 microseconds. And you can see one, two, three, four, five, that's where it essentially becomes zero at five time constants or 50 microseconds, five times tau. So there they are. So you can see my input voltage is about just under five volts, right? So I've got the power supply set for five volts, but it's probably around 4.75. But look at the size of the inductive spikes. First, notice that 
when the signal goes high, the voltage across the inductor goes way up, right? So there's an inductive spike happening there. And that's going up to, looks like six volts or so. Let's uh, drop that down a little more so we can see it better. Yeah, it's going up to about seven or eight volts. Okay. And then if we look at what happens when it goes low, you see immediately the voltage on the inductor reverses. And we'll spread this out a little bit so you can see that time constant taking place. There we go. Well, I hope you enjoyed that and you learned something useful about inductors. If you did, then how about a thumbs up and a share and smash that subscribe button. And until next time, cheers.